We'd like to welcome you back on the Tech Factor podcast by Purple Quarter. We have Vishy Ranganath in the house. Thank you, Vishy, for coming here. Thank you very much. So for the audiences to know about Vishy, Vishy, you've uh, done your B-Tech and M-Tech and then you moved on to your, la- I'll just talk about your last three stints, Mindtree, Intuit, Google, and now Clary. Yeah. Loads of time spent in Intuit, yeah, about 12 odd years and then Google for about two years and now it's been over six months at Clary, I suppose. Yes, yes. So could you tell us a little bit about the three different orgs that you've been part of? Sure. Um, when I joined Intuit in 2007, that was the time when I was interested in getting into product companies. Okay. Um, that it was a change for me and what I realized was it, at that time India had two companies from, from an employee's perspective, services in, in the tech space, services companies and then there were a few emerging product companies, most of them were ODCs right. from, uh, from uh, foreign companies. And that was a time when I realized that um, uh, I like um, technology more than large organizations uh, and I wanted to work with, with smaller teams that have a larger impact on, on the business and on the customer. So I found my way to multiple, I mean, I talked to multiple companies and I ended up at Intuit, which was quite unknown at that time in India and also to me to a large extent. Although I'd been an Intuit product user as an individual uh, at, uh, earlier, um, wow. or, you know, the Quicken product which right. came from Intuit, I was a user of that. Mm-hmm. And I never imagined I'd end up working for them someday, but I, that's what happened. And the 12 years I had spent at Intuit was amazing because of, uh, you know, in that period, the number of transformations that happened in a tech company, uh, Intuit had to reinvent itself multiple times to stay relevant. Right. Um, they went, they went from um, US only to global. They went from desktop to online. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they also went to mobile and, uh, and social. So they really had to reinvent themselves. Uh, and I was in the middle of that because I worked on this fledgling product called QuickBooks Online, mm-hmm. which no one cared about, um, uh, but which is what became the flagship product that it is today and has become the main um, uh, value that Intuit really brings into the market. Right. So being for being in a large company, in a company like that for many years, the advantage is you get to see multiple reinventions and transformations that are necessitated by external factors, internal uh, uh, strategy and things like that. And you learn a lot from that. Mm. I went to Google from uh, Intuit more, uh, that was a strange um, turn of events because I was looking for uh, a change because 12 years is a long time and I wanted a change. I wanted a change of scene, new type of work, etc. And um, I wasn't particularly looking for Google, but as I started my search, they reached out to me and uh, I said, okay. And I went through the interview process. So when I, when they reached out to me, I was not so, um, I wasn't thinking so much about Google at all. Okay. But through the interview process, I warmed up to the idea of working for Google and eventually many months later, because that process is extremely (laughs) slow, uh, I ended Mm. up joining uh, 12 years after I started at Intuit, I left them and I joined Google. And at Google, I worked uh, on the, uh, in the cloud organization leading work, the Google workspace um, engineering teams. Google Workspace is what used to be called G Suite. Right. Uh, they rebranded it when I was there. I was part of that rebranding exercise also. And I led enterprise um, uh, engineering teams that built enterprise features in the Google Workspace product. So um, all these uh, collaboration tools that we use, all of us use like Gmail, Docs, etc. I was leading teams working on those products and making them enterprise ready because enterprise needs are different from uh, consumer needs. True. Um, taking a step back at Intuit, uh, just to quickly recap, I led engineering, global engineering for the uh, QuickBooks online product and also the data platform, which was the, what is called the big data team, uh, mm-hmm. but the product was the Intuit data platform. I led engineering for that. Uh, before I left them. So that was a wonderful experience and that's how I got into the world of big data also. Sure. Um, Fast forward to now working for Clary. Um, 
that big data experience that I gained at Intuit came in very handy, comes in very handy at Clary. Mm -hmm. um, because Clary is a company that is basically a, a, an insights company. Uh, it uh, Its product is built, is basically insights on revenue data, revenue insights on data that uh, is gathered from around the enterprise. So that's what Clary is about. So being a, we are essentially a large big data team mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's something that um, I can lead more effectively because of my past experience in that space. It's not something new for me to learn. Sure. So again, I came from Google to Clary because I wanted to come to a startup, simple. Uh, Google is way too big and I uh, felt that I need to do something in a smaller company where I can... Uh, I, where I can have a bigger impact. So that is how I I came here with your help, of course. Um, and at Clary, now we are in a very exciting time. Sure. Um, hyper growth and uh, evolving strategy and competition um, uh, appearing mm -hmm. by the day uh, as, as people warm up to the space that we have created. Right. So that's my journey in the last uh, 15 years. Sure, sure. Yeah. So if I were to actually, I'm going to take a cue from what you mentioned, right? Intuit, transformation, Google, large company, and now Clary, which is a startup, right? So I'm sure the way that you look at a product, the transformation or engineering, I'm sure it's different between these two uh, orgs, right? One is a giant org, the other one's a startup. Yes. So could you uh, tell us from an engineering standpoint, how does it change or are the rules uh, typical? Yeah, so there are different ways in which the, uh, uh, you know, these uh, engineering differs in these large and small companies. In large companies, typically, there are multiple mature product lines. Right. And there are engineering teams working on these product lines, large product organizations, large engineering organizations, um, to a large extent siloed from each other. Um, that also tends to happen, even though the founders don't want it. Uh, it tends to happen right. um, and um, I worked on products like QuickBooks Online uh, and the uh, workspace product in Google which are mature which have been around for many years and have millions of customers already using these products so um, because of the maturity of the product you are usually making incremental changes to that product right uh, you're fixing issues you're responding to customer pain um, and you're building new features, but not at the same rate at which you would build features in a smaller company. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one difference. Um, of course, big companies also come up with innovations and new lines of business and they s launch new products. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about my experience of working on large and mature products which have been around for multiple years. Um, so it's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, every now and then, every few years, um, changes happen in the industry that force you to rethink what your, how you have built your product and how you how you run your product. Um, for example, um, when ML became a big thing, mm -hmm. right? Everyone started thinking about, okay, how can I use it? Yeah. So large, large and small companies had to do that, and Intuit did the same thing. Google did the same thing, right? So those kind of opportunities do arise, mm -hmm. but for the uh, for the large part, you have uh, mature products with minimal changes, right? In uh, and the process maturity is very high. The engineering process maturity is usually very high in these companies because the cost of mistakes is also very high. Correct. Right. You don't want to break the product when you have a billion users. True. Right. If Gmail is down, the whole world comes down. Right? Right. So things like that, what happens is that your engineering process maturity is one of the you know, you know it highest. In fact, I have not seen a place where other than Google, Google is where I think Google sets the standard for engineering excellence and maintaining quality and developing at scale. So those are the things you get to learn over there. In small companies, um, product market fit itself is a question. Right. right? So if as long as you have not achieve product market fit you have to hustle you have to be agile you have to try many things while being true to your vision or the space you want to operate in that's a very interesting experience um, and you a lot of things that you take for granted in a large company you cannot 
in a small company. Um, Clary achieved its product market fit uh, a few years ago before I got here. So there's a little bit more stability now, but nothing compared to what was there at Google uh, or at Intuit. Um, we are still um, defining the rules of the space mm -hmm. and that's what makes it exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are a leader, then you end up defining the game yeah. and others play the game, sure. but you are the one who sets the rules for it. And as of today, Clary is a, re a leader in the revenue operations and revenue intelligence space. And what's exciting about working for a company like this is you get to participate um, with the founders and with um, the execs. Um, you get to think about, you know, what is the right way to evolve this product, what to build, which customers to go after, what problems to solve. Because you have 10 problems that look interesting but we have to pick our problems so that we are true to our strategy and we continue to refine uh, our identity. Sure. Um, uh, and that is the challenging, interesting part that every startup deals with, which I get to experience in a place like Clary today. That is awesome. Yeah. You mentioned something that's very close to a lot of founders who will be listening to this podcast, revenue operations and revenue intelligence, right? Ah. That's what we all are after. <laughs> yeah. So could you tell us from uh, Clary, from an engineering perspective, how do you drive that with data? You know, if you can delve a little more deep uh, and yeah. with, with some examples probably. Sure. So let's take the case of, uh, in fact, I would, I'll use the term that, our CEO Andy Byrne uses mm -hmm. um, these days when he talks about what Clary is about, right? We help CEOs and chief revenue officers answer one question. Okay. Will I meet, beat, or miss my targets for the year? Wow. My revenue targets for the year. That's the question that they're looking to answer. And they have to answer that because they owe that answer to investors, analysts, and to the street. Sure. Right? Um, and predictability is, in a way, even more important than the actual revenue, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in fact, recently there was an example where, um, if I remember correctly, it was Apple. Apple shares, um, uh, uh, they, they failed to meet their revenue targets, mm -hmm. but they figured it out in advance and they announced it to the street saying, we are not going to meet our Got targets. It. Got and it. their share price actually went up not wow. wrong because they uh, preempted it you know no one was surprised right mm -hmm. and i'm saying that just as an example uh, to make the point that predictability is more important the act more important than the actual revenue um, and clary helps customers achieve that mm -hmm. now how do we do it um, today if you look at how um, sales forecasting is done in companies. Right. Um, they use three uh, tools for this, right? First of all, they put together a team of analysts and uh, technologists and SQL developers and people who are good with spreadsheets, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Um, and they pull data from the CRM, they pull data from BI, mm -hmm. and, they pull, and, and they use Excel uh, or spreadsheets to uh, pull data from different systems like this and then come up with a prediction model. They, they even do manual things like, you know, ref, uh, talking to sales teams and seeing which, which deals are going well mm -hmm. and, and uh, who, who is likely to close Correct. deals, etc. Mm -hmm. And if you have a complex sales organization, this process happens at all levels in the organization and then the, slowly the data is put together and it bubbles up and it's rolled up and then what is finally given to the CRO is, uh, is basically something that comes from this exercise. Um, it's actually an art, not a science. And at the end of the day, CEOs and CROs, it's a very nerve wracking thing for them to trust that number that comes in front of them saying, I'm going to go tell people outside the company, stakeholders, that this is, a com this is what we're going to make this year. Clary decided to make this process a highly data driven process. Wow. Right, and how do how did we do that? So we decided to bring data from CRMs and various other revenue sources, revenue signal sources, so sources that have revenue signals in them. Bring them all into our data mart, or what we call data hub, mm -hmm. um, and we have defined the schema for that. We have 
brought all that we ingest all that data on a continuous basis and since we bring it all into one data warehouse and we have defined the right representation for that which is optimized for us to be able to query it and to be able to generate insights from it that is very powerful not only that we actually create a time series representation of the crm data which doesn't exist in the crm itself all right and that time series expect uh, representation allows us to do even more allows us to run ml models for example on it mm -hmm. um, if i have a time series representation of my opportunities and my deals for the last 6 months maybe for the last 4 years or 5 years then that data is extremely powerful if i am able to do the right kind of ml on it i can produce scores i can produce um um revenue predictions or the future sales predictions based on that data sure. if i have revenue data from the last from the, the entire history of the company i can use that and along with many various other pieces of data i can predict my revenue uh, for this year and perhaps the next year and ml is helping us with this because it allows us to process large amounts of data and we have the compute power to do it and what we can do today is that we can produce scores and these scores are um, help cro's these these scores help cro's figure out which deals are going well which ones need their attention when do for which deal do they need to pick up the phone and talk to the decision maker on the other side sure uh, where to focus their energies mm -hmm. so um, you might have heard of sales coaching and sales um, enablement where we uh, help our sales uh, people on the at the ground level at the field level be more effective correct um, this is taken it to the next level yeah. where you know not only do we do that we uh, i'll talk about wingman which enables us uh, to help with sales coaching but with the insights that we can generate the uh, forecasting and the predictions that we give cro's uh, allows them to go out there and tell people confidently what is really happening and this is something that has been proven time and again if you look at the feedback that people have given about clary um, uh, on social media and the, the kind of emails that our sales people receive from their prospects and their customers um, in fact one of the ceos actually said on an analyst call he took the name of clary and said we have a new tool called clary mm -hmm. so going forward uh, what we tell you, we'll be able to tell you with a lot more confidence. Very nice. And that's what Clary is about. It helps CROs, as I said earlier, answer this question about, you know, am I going to meet, beat or miss my targets for the year? Very nice. And that's based on a ton of data from around your enterprise, which we bring together into one um, data warehouse. And we call these revenue signals. So revenue collaboration and governance is our world mm -hmm. so we are going from revenue operations to revenue collaboration and governance so we will be that company that allows you to run revenue in a scientific way rather than um, guessing got it i have a question though you spoke about forecasting right mm -hmm. so what about external factors those get put in as well into the system when they you know you're looking at historical data you you mentioned that yes. i get that but what about let's take current scenario right people are talking about market turbulence what's happening yes or uh, for a company which probably has a runway of let's say just a year plus so revenues are extremely important otherwise funds have uh, need to get infused into the That's company right. so how does it work at clary how are these external things uh, yeah, that's a great question. And um, the answer to that is, yes, revenue signals exist in the most unlikely of places. Right. Right. Um, one of the category of revenue signals that we give a lot of importance to is what we call activity data. Okay. Activity signals. And activities are basically interactions between humans mm. or interactions between humans and computers. Right. It could even be interactions between computers mm -hmm. right or applications um, so let's say let's take the first example so interactions between humans can be meetings conversations emails yeah. and various types of communications mm -hmm. right now imagine what kind of content or what kind of insights can be gleaned from a conversation multiple conversations that happen between 
a salesperson and the decision maker on the other side. Sure. Right. Um, that a lot of these external factors that you talked about come in over there. Right. They can be gleaned from there. Right. Right. So with the technology to convert speech to text and do analytics on that, uh, even doing things like video analysis, mm -hmm. which we don't have today, but we might in the future. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these external factors that you talk about, uh, they get fed into our system. And they also get included in the uh, logic that we apply for predictability. Okay. So um, the sentiment of the people we are talking to, mention of competition, uh, mention of price, mm -hmm. you know, all these things play a role in us figuring out the health of that opportunity um, that you are currently uh, managing with a particular customer or prospect. So external factors do come in through that channel, right? And in the future, we are thinking of building something called a signal platform. Okay. Uh, and exactly, uh, as I said earlier, revenue signals can come from anywhere. So we want to build and make this platform available as APIs mm -hmm. for anyone to plug into and feed revenue signals to us, which we can include in our analysis. Sure. And this is something that we have been talking about and we are likely to start building in the next quarter or so. Um, but it's precisely to address um, points like you know, what you made where you know the uh, conditions outside the company, mm -hmm. um, competition, the market, etc., and external factors also are revenue signals. Sure. And we are constantly looking for ways to feed those also into the system and figure out what, how to do something meaningful with those signals. Interesting. So I think a lot of uh, data points, even for the CFO, uh, the way that they would be looking at data would also change. That's how I'm. Yes. Of this entire in case, fact, right? we eat yeah. our own dog food. Uh, our CFO <laughs> and our CRO, uh -huh. our CRO is our power user. Mm -hmm. okay. So right. the CRO of Clary mm -hmm. cannot work without the Clary application running. Wow. So our own data is in Clary. Sure. And uh, the CRO, he runs his uh, meetings and his planning and his reviews with his sales teams all based on the data that he sees within the Clary product itself. Amazing. Which is pretty awesome. I mean, I saw this at Google. Right. At Google, we I was building um, Google Workspace products and we were using it them ourselves. Sure. So we use Gmail, we use Docs uh, ourselves to run our own business. Similarly, in Clary, we use uh, uh, Clary ourselves. Very nice, very nice. Since there's a lot of data exchange that happens, right? So how does this entire thing work? How do you customize it for people? Is there a customization? That's my first question. Yes, there is. Okay. And if you customize it, then there would be two different things, right? Like we were just discussing before we got onto this uh, podcast, we were talking about how product and engineering are at loggerheads at uh, points of time, mm -hmm. right? Because what one business wants is what product is thinking and engineering is seeing if you can implement what uh, the business wants. So how does it work? I'm, I'm super uh, curious about Clary. How does it work when you're customizing so much? Well, it's a little easier at Clary than it was in my previous companies like Google and uh, Intuit because yeah. we are smaller. Right. Um, we have a less complex organizational structure. <laughs> okay. uh, we have a quicker decision making mm -hmm. and fewer layers in the organization. So, yes, I should say, I should begin by saying that it is better mm -hmm. at Clary, as you can expect in any small company. Mm -hmm. um, customizations, the product is highly customizable. Okay. So, this is, a, this is a product that once an enterprise customer signs up for it, we have a professional services team that they, who might take a couple of weeks to set up the product for you. Mm -hmm. Because we have to set up Clary to ingest your data. Right. from va various systems that you have to ingest that into our cloud and do the analytics on it and then make those available to you as insights. Sure. So that's not a, um, it, it is not a trivial setup. Okay. Uh, you need a, a services team for that, a professional services team for that. By the way, we are making that also as much self-serve as possible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, revenue forecasting uh, is, a, is an esoteric thing. Not everyone understands 
all the different flows that exist in our product. But people who are in the revenue teams, who are in sales and finance, they understand it better. So it's a it, it's a product that's used by specialists. Mm. We need to understand that. Um, so the customization happens during that setup. Each company you know, uh, decides how best they want to use the product, what data is important for them. And then based on that, we set up the ingestion and the uh, application configurations. Sure. Um, now, the, uh, to your point about the tension between um, product and engineering, right? Um, our culture is to focus on the problem that the customer has, and that aligns us. That's how we get aligned. So we are hung up on, we are, we are more interested in the problem than in how we solve it. Sure. We, first, we want to align on what the problem is and what we want to achieve. And then we go out and find the best way to solve that problem using the best technologies and do it, doing it in such a way that it's performant, scalable, uh, available, uh, and does what we want it to do. Sure. So that being the case, um, in Clary, Everyone is, uh, especially at the leadership level, you know, uh, we are aligned in that sense. Um, and we have a, a sensible prioritization process where uh, based on debates and data and justifications and, you know, back and forth, you know, it is possible for us to align um, and explain and, you know, go, go through the churn of questioning and uh, challenging, etc., but then come to a conclusion where we are all aligned on the priorities. Right. And that happens in all companies, nothing special about Clary, but it is more efficient in smaller organizations. And that's what I'm seeing here compared to how it was in other uh, places where I worked. Sure. Um, our focus is, like I said, you know, how many companies can uh, explain what they do with this one sentence? Uh, as I said, exactly. am I going to meet, beat, or miss my targets? Sure. That's what Clary is about. So when you are able to describe your mission in a simple sentence, mm -hmm. with the right leadership, you can get everyone, all your ducks in a row, and you can get everyone aligned on what the problem is. You know, Don't get hung up on the technology or the how of solving it. Don't get caught up in um, buzzwords. But tell me how you're solving this problem and how you're making the customer's life better. So that customer orientation and uh, laser focus on solving one problem is what uh, gives us the advantage. Sure. I'm just going to pick uh, from what you just mentioned slightly earlier. It's not trivial. So we'll go with that. And I wanted to check with you. So I'm sure there would be a lot of integrations that would be happening, right? Yes. Because your system's talking to multiple systems. Yes. Is it hard? I mean, I'm sure you're in different geographies. So how does that work? Yeah, so integrations is a very big challenge for us. In fact, I lead the integrations team, which okay. is based out of India. Right. Um, and uh, we have to integrate with a variety of different systems mm -hmm. uh, so that we can ingest data from those systems. We have different paradigms. We have pull versus push. We have uh, CRMs. We have activity. We have other types of signals. Um, and as companies evolve in their uh, how they, what their business model is and what their revenue model is, we have to keep up with that. Correct. Um, so there's constant. we have to constantly think about the relevance of our solution as companies evolve. Right. Um, but building, if you can build one of three or four integrations, but if you have to build a hundred integrations, doing one of integrations is also very, uh, it's actually a bad thing to do. It's unsustainable. Yeah. So we partner with products, third parties mm -hmm. that can act as bridges um, to various applications. So right now we're working with a with a team, uh, a product called Fivetran. Mm -hmm. So Fivetran allows us to sell, uh, connect and ingest data from various different types of applications. Mm -hmm. So if we use if we use Fivetran connectors, then uh, we do not have to worry so much about uh, how exactly they connect to the end system and pull data from it. So that's one of our ways in which we reduce our complexity where we have to do a lot of integrations. We rely on third-party products. So they, 
they are the ones who are our tentacles into various <laughs> other systems sure i think somewhere intuit and google has really helped you with what i'm hearing right because you've been part of so many transformations mm-hmm. when you look at integrations as uh, a thing it doesn't look such a hard problem for you to solve that's why i'm when i when i hear you saying it it doesn't seem like yeah it's well, too hard well it is a it's a hard problem and every company is struggling with it mm-hmm. um i don't think there is a um anyone who uh, anyone has a magic bullet right. whatever i'm telling you is fairly obvious and anyone in our position would do the same thing sure um uh i think the right i think where we don't want to go wrong is in our choice of the technology and the choice of the partner mm-hmm. make sure that you know that relationship will work out it long term right. and they can scale with our needs they can scale grow with our customers needs so those are the considerations so um and and there are there are ways in which you can figure that out and look at their current customers who are they serving mm-hmm. are they serving already serving more complex um customers than us <laughs> then that's a good thing mm-hmm. right so there are various ways in which that can be done but as of today we are using a a product called fivetran um that allows us to reduce the number of individual uh custom integrations sure but you uh, since you dealing with so much of data so i'm sure uh, the machine learning uh, would be like enormous right i mean it's learning as it's talking to so many different parts of data customers yes so over a period of time it's almost like you're getting upgraded every single time as a company as well right yeah. how is data protected for uh, your end consumers <laughs> well um we have as you might imagine um an agreement with every customer who signs up with us right. that we will be um, good custodians of their data mm-hmm. um and we follow all the standard practices of you know how how long the data should exist in our systems when it should be purged right um etc and who gets to see it mm-hmm. uh, so those are all uh, th- there's a lot over there where i have seen larger companies are more mature than smaller companies mm-hmm. um, so we are building our um, maturity or our capability there to ensure that the data is handled well and the minimum number of people have access to that data uh, for example uh, support needs some level of access right so they can look at your data to help you with your problem right so there are certain minimum needs for us to be able to provide value but beyond that that data should be out of bounds right. for um, and it should be on an as needed basis right if you don't need to see it you should never have access to it mm-hmm. so all those basic protection mechanisms are already in place right uh, we are built on aws and we take advantage of the technologies that they already have mm-hmm. um but over a period of time that complexity is going to uh, go up tremendously right uh, and we need scalable processes and scalable um systems that continue to work well mm-hmm. uh, and when we expand out of north america to other continents europe etc and their data protection rules need to be applied Correct. we have to be able to do that in a cross cutting seamless manner without without uh, disrupting our business right. so those are the um, um foundational things that we have to take care of now in our planning and um system design and our architectural decisions sure. um so that we are not painting ourselves into a corner and 5 years down the line we find that oh we have to do a major reengineering which will take us 2 years correct uh, we should not be in that situation makes sense makes sense i like the four sided approach so uh, vishi i wanted to also check with you you spoke about wingman right so yes. can you talk about how that has actually powered up clari sure yeah so um I'll take a step back and talk about the space. So the space of revenue operations um what we are seeing is that we have a uh, uh, half a dozen players in the space. Some of them are conversational intelligence. They started off as conversational intelligence mm-hmm. vendors and some like us started off as revenue operations uh, companies where we were basically bringing revenue signals together to provide better predictability. Okay. And now what's happening is that the people who are in the uh, conversational intelligence space realize that they have an opportunity to move into our space. Mm-hmm. Um and 
go beyond just meeting and conversational intelligence and get into the business of revenue prediction right because they are in the sales coaching area they want to move from sales coaching into revenue operations got it um so the wingman acquisition is partly a defensive play okay where you know we also want Uh, our uh, our initial strategy was to be able to do integrations with existing ci vendors but then we figured out that having our own ci product will be uh, will will make us put us in a stronger position with respect to our competition um and by owning a ci product um we have by acquiring wingman we've got one of the best ci products now in house we have we own it ourselves so we can cater to that market small uh, the down market where people are not quite ready to spend uh, as on the clary application but they want sales coaching and they can use ci okay. so we can cater to that so we can go down market the wingman team can go up market now that we are we have joined hands and most importantly um the ci signals the, uh, the ci data also comes into our data hub now mm-hmm. and um surfaces in the right workflows within our clary experience making it even more powerful right right um this allows us to answer questions like uh, you know if the cr let's say the cro is looking at their um, uh, plan for the quarter and they're looking at all the deals and opportunities and they want they are able to query the system and ask questions like um show me those opportunities in which we had a meeting in the last 3 weeks in which this particular competitor was mentioned mm-hmm. uh or price was mentioned or show me um opportunities in which we had um meetings which were attended by a c level person of the uh, from the customer side mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that kind th- that kind of um interesting and very powerful querying becomes possible when we combine sure. ci data with the data that we already have so that what hap- that's what happens here we say 1 plus 1 equal to 3 um <laughs> clary plus wingman mm. is stronger than uh just the sum of the two sure um so it strengthens our position in this space mm. uh it gives wingman access to enterprise customers and they are working um very hard right now to make their product the wingman team is making it enterprise ready and it gives clary access to a smaller uh, uh, uh you know set of customers or customers who are uh, earlier in their life cycle and they will be as they grow they can uh, we can cross we can upsell to them and they can move from using just one feature to the entire clary product so oh, we see see this as a win win for both companies and for us to become you know stronger in the space and what is the size of firms that can use clary because i really love the model you know i love love the way you are saying that we can either use the suite of services or you can pick the services right so yeah so i mean this is where our skew strategy needs to be uh, developed so what are the skews that we uh, sell what are their prices mm-hmm. um, etc and how how do we provide an upgrade path for mm-hmm. customers as their needs grow uh, mm-hmm. over time um so your your question was about um can you repeat your question again the size of the firm the size yeah, yeah. so the the size so we are our customers are enterprises right. and there is no limit to how big they can be okay. our largest customer is hp okay. and hp has got if i'm not wrong the world's largest sales force in implementation true, true. so uh, and and we are ingesting that data into our uh, product so the scale at which it happens on a daily basis you can imagine the volume of data that is flowing into mm-hmm. uh, our data hub so there is really no limit to the size of the company mm-hmm. um the only thing that matters is uh you know if you are interested in better revenue predictability and you want to make your sale you want to run your sales teams really efficiently and you want your sales leaders to focus on the right problems right. to maximize revenue then we are the way we are the solution for that right got it so the size really does not matter sure. um but larger companies tend to use uh, the really small enterprises don't use clary today mm-hmm. 
Um, but with wingman within the Clary suite, that will also change. Got it. Understood. So from a perspective of you, obviously you're leading the entire region. Uh, and you know you've taken over as the site lead for Clary in India. So would you be hiring at this point of time? Are you looking at getting in more engineers, product folks? Yes. Yeah, um, we are constantly on the lookout for engineers at all levels. As of now, I am uh, focused on strengthening the leadership team in India. So I'm hiring uh, multiple senior positions. Um, uh, and that's very important for us to be able to scale and grow to the next level. Um, I, my strategy is to build a strong leadership team first mm -hmm. and then work with them to build uh, the entire organization out. Sure. So as of today, we have about um, 40 engineers and we have plans for uh, uh, you know, quadrupling at least uh, this team. So um, to be able to operate um, and for, for all these teams to be high performing teams, I want the right leadership in place. Sure. So, as of now, we have positions open in um, it, at all levels in engineering. And not only in engineering, we have other um, functions in India. We have customer support. We have professional services. And then we also have program management. We have a product team. Mm -hmm. We have a director of product management in India. So all these teams are on, lookout, on the lookout for people. Sure. Um, uh, and uh, growing the Clary India site is a, is a priority for not only for me, but for my boss and for the CEO also. Sure, sure. So any specific, uh, you know, I'm sure we leave your handles for people to get in touch with you, but want to know what is it that, you know, Clary looks for when you're hiring your engineers, your leadership team? Sure. Um, so culture is very important. Uh, I think that's more important than anything else. Sure. And, uh, uh, you know, our culture is, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we are laser focused on the problems that we solve. We want to do the best work of our lives. Mm -hmm. We want to respect each other mm -hmm. and we want to respect everybody, uh, everyone who works in Clary. We want to build a, uh, a community within, we, we have a community within Clary where people feel welcome, included, um, and love to come in to work every day. Right. Um, very respectful and um, inclusive culture is what we have. At the same time, we have a high performance bar and we do not shy away from um, communicating hard messages to people who are not um, performing at the level that we expect. Um, <clears throat> but we also have a, a very good interview process that helps us find the best people. So. This is a place to work where, you know, if you're interested in a, working in a place where you love your co-workers um, and you're solving interesting problems and the company's on a high, hyper growth path, sure. uh, which everyone benefits from eventually. Right. True. So that's what I would say about Clary. Um, there are many great companies out there. I have, my past companies have also had excellent culture, mm. um, but I'm telling you what how Clary thinks, you know, we use the word remarkable quite a lot. We are a remarkable company. We want to do remarkable work mm -hmm. and we want remarkable people. Awesome. So just uh, to add to what you just said, I think for people who would want to write to Vishy, I'd like to give you two more sentences about Vishy as a leader. I think for all those youngsters or for uh, leaders who'd like to go and work with Vishy, interesting piece would be that he first listens uh, and then asks questions and then formulates what needs to be said. I think that's a very, uh, you know, uh, beautiful leadership style that you have, Vishy. So I just thought I should add that. Uh, a lot of humility as well as a leader. So I'm sure people would love working with you. So we'll definitely leave your handles on uh, on this podcast for people to reach out to. I appreciate that. <laughs> Perfect. Are there any parting words that you'd like to share for youngsters who are looking at uh, you as a role model or people who at your peer levels who feel that, hey, uh, what should we be doing to get to where you got to? So, Well, uh, I would only say this. Uh, don't compromise. Strive for excellence. Don't be satisfied till you get it right. Um, and, you know, work as hard as you need to, but don't compromise. Um, excellence is what is going to make you happy eventually. Awesome. Thank you so much for those last words. I'll keep that in mind too. Uh, thank you so much for coming over to our office and doing this podcast with us, Vishy. Thank you so much you. for inviting me. I enjoyed my conversation with you. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you so much.